Hi everybody, um, welcome again. Today's tutorial will be about the efficient architectures for deep learning. And specifically, we'll start with an overview of measures of efficiency. And then we'll dive into our atlas of uh, efficient models, starting from the early models like SwissNet and going through mobile nets, MNAS net, efficient nets, and based on time, we'll see where we get. We'll also look at performers, efficient architectures based on transformers, and maybe regnets. And uh, I just want to emphasize we're not covering algorithms that improve efficiency, such as pruning and quantization. We're focusing on the architectures. Some of the slides here are based on this blog. Uh, and this blog focuses on uh, mobile, mobile uh, architectures mainly for iPhone, but uh, you're welcome to take a look at it if you want. So measuring efficiency for deep learning. Let's start with the concrete measures, stuff that we can, we know actually impacts our uh, uh, either deployment or training of models. Uh, the, fr the first obvious uh, measure is the training or inference time. Uh, obviously a model, uh, two models with the same accuracy one running at half the time, uh, the, the, quicker, the quicker one would be more efficient in, uh, based on this measure. And also for training time, if we can train a model uh, with half the time, get into the same accuracy, it will be considered more efficient. Other measures that are concrete are also a memory usage. And uh, that mainly impacts when we have uh, devices that have memory limitations. If we can get a model to, uh, to the same accuracy, but using half the memory, it is more efficient. And also power consumption. And of course, all these measures have some, uh, some hardware specific components in them. Some of them are not hardware specific, some of the components, but running the same model on different hardware will get you different timings. Now, in order to measure these uh, uh, efficiency measures, sometimes we don't use them exactly um, because it's easier to measure something else. So there are commonly used proxies for, the, for these measures. Uh, one obvious uh, proxy is the number of parameters, and that is used a lot. And if we want to do it in PyTorch, we can use the NumL function to sum up the number of parameters in our model. We can do it also for the trainable parameters if user requires grad. Another proxy that is commonly used is the number of multiply adds or multiply accumulates operations, uh, because those, those are the ones that dominate both memory and training time or inference time in most of our models based on convolutions or fully connected. And to calculate this in PyTorch, uh, you can use something like pr a profiler. You can look it up. It's pretty easy to use. And uh, another very commonly used proxy is the number of floating point operations. And for this, it's a bit complicated to calculate by yourself. There are a lot of uh, biased estimates. The one that I found uh, most accurate in my use cases was this library from Facebook, FVCONN and you import this flop count analysis and you can get the flop count for your model, either based on the layers, different models, or for the total number of flops. And one more uh, point I want to emphasize, uh, estimating or measuring the training and inference time is not that trivial when you're using GPUs and parallel processes. You can't just use the time that time uh, Python model and to get around this problem of the uh, parallel uh, processes and timing them, you can look at the, these uh, uh, functions, the Torch CUDA event and Torch CUDA synchronize in order to synchronize between processes in the GPU and CPU and actually measure the time correct. Any questions on this? Can you repeat what FLOP is? FLOP, floating point operations. Okay, so what that's does that mean? what does that mean? That uh, think a floating point is a number represented in floating point, right? And operations is doing something with a floating point number, like adding floating points or multiplicity points. And the number of these operations is a proxy for the inference of training time. 
okay? Okay, thanks. No problem. Okay, so now to talk about efficient architectures. And this plot is a bit outdated, but it shows the variety of different models out there. Of course, we're not going to cover all the uh, model families out there, but just to understand these types of plots, what we have on the x-axis is some proxy of uh, efficiency, in this case, the flops. And on the y-axis, we'll have the accuracy on some data set or some uh, benchmark. In this case, this is top one accuracy on ImageNet. And we can see dip different models in this space. Also the size of the circles is indicative of the number of parameters. And we can see the first model we look at today, which is SqueezeNet down here, very low number of flops, but also not so accurate. And we can see different type of architectures. And one uh, concept I want to introduce is the efficient frontier, the line we see here. The efficient frontier it, it is uh, where we can see the models that are most efficient for a given accuracy. Or on the other way around, the models that for a given efficiency are the most accurate. So if we look at these squeeze and excitation resnext, we can see they are close to this efficient frontier. Uh, and if we look at VGGs, we see they are very far from this, this efficient frontier. Now, our first architect, architect of the day is SqueezeNet. This is uh, uh, from around the time of the VGGs, um, before even ResNets, uh, 2015, I think. And as you can see from the title of the paper, they report AlexNet level accuracy with uh, 50x fewer parameters and uh, less than a, a half a megabyte of model size. And as, uh, this shows that they focus on efficiency here. And in order to understand all these models, let's keep in mind the regular blocks of the VGG network, okay? And specifically, let's focus here on this uh, three by three conv uh, layer that has an input of 60 uh, feature maps, 64 feature maps, and an output of 128 feature maps. If we think about this layer alone, we know the number of parameters here will be a three by three by 64 by 128. Now let's compare it to what the SqueezeNet authors introduce. They introduce this fire model. That's the main contribution. And the input to this specific fire model is still a, a 64 um, feature maps, okay? But we start the operation here instead of a three by three three con convolution with a one by one convolution that has an output of 16 feature maps. So we reduce the, the input a lot. And this operation is called a squeeze operation in their uh, fr framework. After this squeeze operation, there is a parallel expanding layers, one with a three by three uh, convolution going from 64, from 16 to 64 feature maps, and a one by one convolution that goes from 16 to 64 feature maps. And then after the activation, these two are concatenated. So if you just think about the inputs and outputs, we still get an input of 64 feature maps, and we still get an output of 128 feature maps. And always keep in mind that we pad the image accordingly to keep the same uh, resolution. And if we now think about this input of 64 output of 128, but looking at the number of parameters of the fire module compared to the regular uh, three by three convolution in VGG, you can see that we'll have about a eight X reduction in parameters. If we just think about the three by three convolution, because the one by one convolution are, are obviously much cheaper. So it will be a little less than eight X improvement here. Uh, for, for this fire model. And also keep in mind for the rest of the lecture, the ResNet bottleneck, which you're supposed to be familiar with by now, which does uh, also something similar, but in a very different way. The, here, if we think about an input of 256 feature maps, the, there is first a, a squeeze operation to 64, then a three by three convolution on this 64, and then an expansion back to the 256. 
And here we have a skip connection without the one by one convolution. So this squeeze net, as you can see, saves a lot of parameters, but how, what does it do in terms of accuracy? We can see here again that it's better than AlexNet, but if we compare it to the VGG, it has a drop in accuracy. So it's much more efficient, but uh, obviously less accurate than VGG. The next architecture we'll talk about is MobileNet. And Mo MobileNet has a few uh, evolution in its architectures all the way from, uh, from V1 all the way to V3. So let's understand the basic concept here and it will be uh, uh, seen again in the next slides. The basic concept of the mobile net for, uh, V1 is this depth-wise depth separable convolution. And this starts with this depth-wise layer. If you remember group convolutions, we said we, said we can have uh, uh, filters that are working on only some of the input uh, feature maps. Depth-wise reduces this to only one feature map per uh, convolution. So what we we still have an input of 64 feature maps, and we are doing a three by three convolution. But each one of these three by three convolution is only working on one of these 64 feature maps. So this costs only 64 by three by three by one. Okay, this depth-wise layer it is then a, a used a, in an expansion layer which takes the, the input and expands it to 128. Exactly the same as we saw in terms of inputs and outputs, but of course, at the, a fraction of the parameters. Another, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yes. Can I ask a question? For uh, sure. It's, it's not so clear for me what the, does this filter does. In three by three, the spatial uh, coordinates is the spatial yeah. weight. Yes, three by three oh. is always, size of the convolution that we are going to run over the images. Let's, let's think about in this stride run, right? So if we do a one by one, you burn through all the pixels or all the input uh, uh, pixels. And if you're doing a three by three, we're taking a, this square of three by three and doing it. Okay. Same with convolution. And, uh, 64, and 64 uh, uh, filters, right? Such filters? In the, in the input, yes. And uh, so what is this one? It's working only on one of these uh, layers? So yes, how does it if choose, we imagine- how does it a, choose which, which layer to work on? You will have a one convolution per feature map. So think about the regular convolution of three by three. You will have a three by three by the input number of feature maps, and you will run this convolutional filter for a, whatever output number of feature maps you want to get, right? And this a, a, a type of architecture, each convolutional feature is three by three by one. It only works on one of the feature maps of the input, but you have 64 of these. So you will have all the 64 input feature maps used, but only separately, not together. Does that answer the so question? So th there will be no uh, 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 will no integration of information. Yes, in this case, yes. there is no integration of information between the different input feature maps. The integration of information will appear in these uh, a one by one uh, expansion rates. Okay, because they work on okay. all the sixty four and expand it to one hundred and twenty eight. I think Achyad. I illustrated it on the side of the slide. So if you have uh... Shai, you're muted. You're if, muted, you have... Shai. Okay, yes, no, so you have three input channels and you have three separable uh, filters. So you learn one filter that operates on the first channel and outputs the first channel, the yellow one outputs the second, and the green outputs the green. In a regular convolution, you'll see a filter that looks at all the three input uh, channels at once and output one output channel. But here there's uh, independent uh, processing of each and every one of the channels. Okay, so the, so the number of parameters in the depth-wise layer, it's three by three by 64? Exactly. 
okay? So, as it is the last question, you can see there's a big reduction of the number of parameters when you're doing this depth-wise there. You, and you do the integration of information using these expansion layers. And this reduces the amount of uh, parameters. It increases the efficiency. And if you can get the models to be a very accurate or as accurate as other models with more parameters like VGG, then you're good, right? You have an efficient model with the almost same accuracy. And that's what we can see here in the table, comparing these uh, mobile nets. They can have different parameters for the full network. We can decide how many layers, which uh, type of, uh, what is the size of the expansion layers. And this will determine these different classes of mobile nets. But if we look at this uh, uh, 1.0 mobile net compared to VG16, we can see it's almost as accurate and with a fraction of the parameters. And one more small uh, uh, um, concept introduced by this paper is this ReLU6 activation function, which instead of uh, thresholding by one, the thresholds by six, right? And that's it, I think, for mobile net version one. So, okay, oh, so always imagine. One, one, one more question regarding this. Yes. So here, when you said the expansion layer one by one by 64 by 128, so you're supposed to have 120, 128 layers here, right? Like in the input. Um, no, here this expansion layer takes as input 64 uh, uh, feature and outputs 128. The next layer will have 128 inputs. Is that, is, was that the question? Yes, yes. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay. So going forward to uh, one more point I want to make, always keep in mind this VGG like uh, architectures. For all these models, I'm only showing what improves their efficiency, but always imagine that there is this uh, layers of different uh, number of feature maps and different, uh, maybe different uh, convolutions, maybe three by three, maybe five by five, but you'll have some uh, a deep number of layers and that will de determine the full architecture. But it doesn't really matter for our purposes. What matters is the single layer Im improvements right now. Okay, so MobileNet version two. Uh, this uh, came out after ResNet, so we can also uh, see uh, these residual connections that were missing in the previous architectures. And there is a, cha a, a change in the notion of these uh, depth-wise convolutions, but still keeping this concept of depth-wise convolution as the main uh, efficiency-creating layer. What we have here in uh, MobileNet version two is inverted residuals and linear bottlenecks. Let's see where we see them. So when we start with this uh, mobile net uh, uh, um, layer, which we can think about as MBCon from now on, because that's how it will be called, we start with an expansion layer and not as we saw before as starting with the depth wise layer. And this expansion layer is a one by one convolution that takes the input and expands it to some number of features, in this case, 384. Then you do the depth-wise layer. So now we are working on the depth-wise layer on this expanded set of feature maps and doing a three by three convolution. And after this, you have a linear bottleneck layer, which reduces the number of feature maps to, in this case, the same number you add in the input so you can have this residual connection. Okay, uh, we, I'll explain shortly why uh, the linear bottleneck, but first let's compare th uh, this type of architecture to the ResNet bottleneck. We see in the ResNet bottleneck, we first have a squeeze or a reduction of the number of feature maps, a three by three convolution, and then an expansion. Here we're doing the, exactly the opposite. We're expanding and then reducing. This is why it's called an inverted bottleneck, okay? And just remember that if you have a stride two at the place where you want to reduce the resolution, then you will not have this skip connection because the dimensions will not fit between the input and the output if this number of feature maps will be lower. Uh, the resolution will be lower. And now the linear bottleneck, which is also, we can think about maybe it's said, why it, is there no activation here? The authors here uh, claim that this linear bottleneck 
preserves the uh, manifold-like um, uh, structure of this uh, 384 feature maps. And they empirically show that it improves accuracy. If you add an activation here, and you reduce the accuracy. So that's why they use a linear bottleneck layer here to reduce the number of feature maps. And that's the basic building block of mobile HD2. Again, you have a, a certain a set of these layers uh, working with some number, with some expansion parameters and some, sometimes you have a three by three and sometimes you have a five by five convolution, but otherwise it's very similar. And if you look at the accuracy levels, you can see that uh, you, based on a, a, a mobile net version one, you can see the accuracy is much improved also with a reduction in the parameters. So going to the next architecture, we, this one is called MNASnet. There is also a NASnet and NAS stands for Neural Architecture Research. Uh, we haven't really covered this in our lectures, so I'll explain it very shortly, but there's a lot more to explain and we can do it either offline or by questions. So the only difference between NASnet and MNASnet is the focus on the hardware. The hardware for the MNASnet is mobile phones, of course. And this neural architecture search goes like this. You have some controller, which in this case is an RNN, and from this controller, you will sample more uh, architectures of model from some source, source space that is uh, previously defined. And then this, uh, th these uh, sampled models are going to be trained. And after they are trained, you, you will look at the final accuracy and deploy them on a model phone to me measure the latency, the, uh, the inference time or uh, as our proxy of efficiency. And as you can see, the reason, the reason they actually do it on the mobile phone is, it, is because it's very hard to predict the inference time just based on the architecture we will add going to the specific hardware. So they actually measure the latency. And then this accuracy and latency um, scores are used as a multi-objective reward in this RL-like reinforcement learning-like a framework in order to change the controller to sample models that are more efficient, that will get higher re rewards, higher accuracy and latency on the mobile phones. And you do this iteratively until you get a controller that you can sample models that are both efficient and have a sufficient accuracy. And this is the basis of this neural architecture search. There's variants of it doing something like reinforcement le learning or evolution algorithms. And I'm not going to get uh, in depth here, but just uh, have this concept in mind and you can look it up later or ask me questions. So this uh, uh, paper after doing all this neural architecture search, search came up with some building blocks and some architecture that is most efficient with for sufficient uh, accuracy. And just remember the actual layers here, they are not part of the search space. They are part of uh, the definition. They are not part of what the um, neural architecture search is searching for. You will have these layers as part of the search space. The way they are connected to each other is what the neural architecture uh, search looks for. And in this case, it came up with a architecture that is pretty close to the mobile net V2, but with some differences. And um, what we see here is an expansion layer, as we saw before, a depth-wise convolution and a squeeze and excitation uh, module. Squeeze and ex excitation is so, uh, sort of like a self-attention mechanism to uh, uh, score the different feature maps based on uh, its uh, contribution. And again, this was not discovered by the NAS algorithm, it was part of the search space. So going into this, uh, getting this type of block is uh, one of the main blocks that is used in the full architecture, as you can see here in this MBCon3 SE. But you also have different type of blocks like MBCon without a uh, squeeze and excitation and it has different uh, sizes. So this is a three by three and this is a five by five. And 
they end up with some architecture. It doesn't really matter what it is. And they show this efficient frontier we uh, previously discussed based uh, compared to MobileNet V2. So we can see that for different uh, efficiency methods, in this case, inference, inference latency, we can see it improves in each one of them. Um, and this concept of neural architecture research is now uh, used in all these papers that are trying to find uh, more efficient architectures. Any questions on this? Um, yes, if, if we have uh, expansion and then we have depth-wise Oh, actually, never mind. Still, the, like I was asking, we're going to ask about the parameters, but it's still depth-wise, even though it's. Uh, Yes, it's uh, yeah. as we saw before. It's still the after the expansion, we still have this depth-wise operation. Okay. Okay. Anything else? What's the difference between convolution three and six? Um, if I remember correctly, uh, that's the different activations. But I'm not sure. I'm I'm saying correctly. I can look it up uh, I, at the end of the tutorial, and I will tell you the answer. Um, okay, any more? Okay, so now we arrive at the last mobile net, mobile net for today, version three. Uh, this one actually didn't introduce a very uh, new concept. They basically took the uh, uh, basic block that uh, the MNAST paper introduced and then ran a specific type of neural architect research called NetAdapt, which, which had the objective of just replacing parts of a, a, some a model in order to maintain the accuracy, but be more efficient. So it's not like a full search in some search switch, but it's actually just a search in replacing parts. But this is one thing they did to improve it. And then they ended up with something very close to the MNASnet model. We still see this uh, expansion convler, then a depth-wise convolution, then this squeeze and excitation model, and this linear bottleneck, okay? One thing they did introduce is this hard swish activation function. Uh, they did this because they uh, saw that the swish activation function, which was used a lot, which is just the x times the sigmoid of x is not efficient. The sigmoid part is not efficient. And you can do it more efficiently by approximating the sigmoid with this ReLU6 of x plus 3 divided by 6. You can see here, it, it, the uh, ReLU6 here is approximating the sigmoid. And then you get this hard switch, which is much more efficient in terms of running time. And another thing they saw is that the uh, last stage of MobileNet version two was uh, not needed. It, it had a lot of operations that increased the uh, running time and number of parameters, but was not actually needed for accuracy. And when they just replace it with taking the average pool and put it in here, it was uh, as accurate. So as you can see, th these are all small improvements. There's nothing very big here but they still show that they improved the, this efficient frontier for mobile phones uh, compared to MNASnet or MobileNet version two. Um, and as you can see, uh, and uh, oh, one more point I wanted to make is that even though they talk about this net adapt uh, for replacing parts, actually most of the uh, part replacing here was manual. So that was just like taking MNASnet and trying to almost manually improve it. And now we get uh, to efficient nets. Uh, efficient nets introduce two uh, cool uh, concepts or two uh, innovations. The first innovation was just doing, a, let's say, a better NAS, better neural architecture search for finding a, a very efficient baseline model. This baseline model is called efficient net B0. And it's comprised of these uh, MB convlers with some uh, uh, resolution, with some uh, uh, different uh, uh, uses of these three by three or five by five um, convolutions. And they did a, a very big uh, neural architecture search in order to find this. Uh, and that's the baseline model they started. 
that's one contribution but maybe not so innovative but at least has a lot of computational power to find this architecture the second thing they introduced in efficient nets is this model scaling rules in all the other uh, architectures we saw when we looked at these um, efficiency frontier we saw that there is actually different models here and there was some methodology for after you get some baseline model for changing it to have a, maybe a better accuracy, but at a, a, a lower efficiency. And these scaling rules always involved the number of uh, channels or the expansion layers and the number of layers, so how deep the network is, and also the resolution that the network will work on. Uh, but uh, the search for these uh, parameters of going wider or deeper or using a uh, higher resolution was always uh, this uh, giant search in uh, all, all the uh, possible uh, combinations of this. Efficient, the efficient net paper introduced this uh, um, scaling rule that is compounded by uh, using a, a rule that takes into account both the width, the depth, and the input resolution. And the way they do this in, in this specific paper is introducing this uh, scaling rule. This scaling rule uh, um, takes that the depth of the network will be this alpha parameters uh, to the power of phi, and the width will be beta parameter to the power of phi, and the resolution will be this gamma to the power of phi. Now they uh, uh, they constrain the alpha, beta, and gamma parameters to be from this form. And the reason is, is that they show the, or they uh, state that the uh, efficiency or the um, cost of, uh, of uh, doing operation scales by, uh, the, by, the depth, uh, by the depth as it is, but for the width and the res resolution, uh, operations scale to the power of two of the width and the resolution. So if you want to change the fee parameter by one and have an increase of two of the total uh, model complexity, you will need these parameters to be in this, uh, uh, to, uh, to convey to this um, a equation. So they constrain all these alpha, beta, and gamma to be alpha times beta to the power of two times gamma to the power of two to be around two. Also, all of them have to be more than one in this case. And this uh, lets you scale a model just by ch changing this phi parameter to be more or less efficient at the cost of a higher or lower accuracy. Okay? And from taking this baseline model and applying this compound rule, they can get these architectures from uh, B1, 2, and all the way to B7, which uh, present a new efficient frontier. Uh, at the time of this publication. So the main contribution, aside from the uh, good uh, baseline model, is uh, making this scaling of models be dependent on all parameters together and not uh, uh, scaling separately by the width or depth or, or resolution. Um, any questions on efficient nets? So now we're doing a detour for a second, and we're going back to transformers. And we want to also look at efficiency for transformers, not just convolution, which is what we looked at so far. So just to remind everybody in the transformers, we have this query queen, a key and value for, uh, matrices that we calculate from the input. And remember that we take the query and the key and we do a dot product between them, and we get this attention matrix, which is then a, a matrix multiplied by the values matrix to get the output of the transformer layer, right? And uh, one point we want to uh, emphasize here is that this attention matrix is, in this case, L by L, where L is the length of the sequence, input sequence. And sometimes it's called T, uh, big T by big T, but this uh, uh, let's call it L for now. So we have L as the 
uh, length of the input sequence. And we see we have to calculate and keep in memory this big attention matrix. And this limits the uh, uh, length of sequences we can actually use for training our models. We are limited because of memory constraints and time constraints, and we cannot increase L as much as we want. And remember that the increasing L, if we think about language models for a second, it increases the uh, uh, attention you give to uh, um, farther and farther away parts of the sequence. And increasing L will let you be more, let's say, a general compared to your full sequence. Uh, so this is a constraint of the regular transformer architectures. In this paper, rethinking attention with performers, the authors wanted to view this in a different way. And they say, well, we know that this attention matrix comes from th this uh, uh, decomposition of two matrices that are that have this dimension, which are smaller than N, than L, right? We have the uh, M parameter here. Uh, but since in the actual attention mechanism, we after we dot product the matrices, we do a softmax operation, which is nonlinear. We can't really decompose this. Uh, we can't really use these decomposed matrices uh, at the beginning to do uh, this efficient operation of first doing the K by V matrix and, and taking out the L parameter and then doing the matrix multiply by Q and V. We cannot do it just because of the softmax operation. But what the authors uh, introduced is a kernel which we see here, which I won't get in depth to what it means because it's not important for our purposes, but they're using uh, some set of random Gaussians to approximate this softmax, oper softmax operation. And by uh, showing that this uh, uh, kernel gives an unbiased estimator to the actual softmax uh, uh, operation, they can decompose this uh, attention matrix into these two matrices Q, uh, uh, Q and K that enable you to first do the dot product between the K and V, the uh, key and value matrices. And that lets you not keep in memory this L by L attention matrix. This uh, improves training time and inference time uh, considerably because you're not dependent on this uh, quadratic form anymore. And what they also showed in the paper, which is cool, is that you can take uh, already trained transformers, replace the attention mechanism with the performer attention mechanism, and do a, a small amount of gradient steps, so a small amount of training, and get back to the same accuracy as it was for the uh, original transformer. So you don't have to train it from scratch as we see in the blue curve here. You can do it much more efficiently, even if we, we play, replace pre-trained transformer architectures. Um, any questions on this? Uh, I'm not doing respect to the field of uh, efficient transformers here by introducing only one architecture architecture performance is not the only one there's a lot of uh, other options out there but uh, this was just a taste of, of this uh, field now going into our final architecture the regnets regnets or their paper uh, that introduced regnets called designing network design spaces uh, introduced a somewhat uh, novel concept and this concept uh, involves around uh, changing this NAS paradigm. So this neural architecture source paradigm states that you have some uh, predefined search space and you're looking for the one best model in this search space, right? That's the NAS uh, paradigm. Uh, the authors of this paper said that actually you can try to design the design space, the uh, search space itself to have a better um, concentration of uh, good models. And in good models, we mean models that are efficient for a given accuracy level 
or for a given efficiency, have the best accuracy. Okay, that's the new concept they introduce. The way they go about it is they start with some very general search space that enables a, 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 a wide range of different architectures. Then they sample models from that big space and they look at these uh, plots which show the error for uh, the cognitive prob prob probability of models having a specific error rate from that design space. And then they introduce some principles that reduce this big design space into a smaller design space and see if when they sample models from this smaller design space, they get a better uh, distribution of this uh, error, uh, error uh, distribution plots. Okay, so you'll have higher concentrations of models with lower accuracy in this B space. And if you can show this, then you have found some principle that reduces a very wide search space to a smaller uh, search space that has a, a better concentration of uh, efficient or accurate models, you know you can sample, uh, you know that uh, specific design principle was good. The one that took you from the A space to the B space. And this way you can find actually design principles that improve the search space, not the specific architecture. And then in this uh, paper, they go on showing some a, a specific design space called the Regnet X or Regnet Y design spaces that uh, shows to be uh, faster or in inference time than uh, the different models in the efficient net family, but uh, keeping the same accuracy or better. Uh, and this uh, concept is changing the view of how we do NAS. The, of course, after you do this design space uh, a design, you can still do a NAS for a specific architecture inside a smaller design space. But if you don't want to do that, you can even just sample models from the best design space and try to uh, uh, train some uh, a set of models and find the one that is most accurate. So that's the uh, novel concept in this paper. And any questions for this? Okay, so um, obviously I've not gone into all the range of possible uh, efficient architectures out there. So if you're interested, you can look online, you'll find other examples like shuffle nets that I haven't uh, introduced here. Uh, and you can find a lot more uh, efficient architectures. And besides that, there's even new architectures coming, I think every month or something like that. And you can see there's already efficient net version two, which uh, spoiler alert takes this depth wise convolution and removes it for at least the first uh, uh, stages in the model and goes back to the regular old three by three convolutions and sh show that it's even more efficient than the original efficient nets or these uh, NF nets that were introduced later. So this field is still growing and still a uh, new and better architectures are coming out almost week, uh, weekly or monthly. Okay, uh, so thank you everybody. And if you have any offline questions, you're welcome to stay.